Okay, welcome everybody to the webinar on the network use cases for distribution and storage. My name is Kelvin Say. I'm a research fellow at the Energy Transition Hub in the University of Melbourne, where I specialize in customer-sided DR market integration. Uh, but before we begin, yes, please join me in acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands from which we're joining this webinar and in paying my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So this webinar is being hosted by the Climate Energy College and the Energy Transition Hub. And this is the sixth in a series of eight webinars on consumer-centric energy, which is sponsored by the Victorian Clean Technology Fund. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Climate Energy College and the Energy Transition Hub website by tomorrow. So in the later part of this webinar, I'll be running as a Q&A session. So during the presentation, please submit your questions at any time um, using the Q&A feature from Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And please upvote any questions that you'd particularly like to be answered as we'll be um, uh, sending questions to, to Nathan in that order. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our speaker. So Nathan is Western Power's lead for grid transformation activities in delivering the energy transformation strategy. His team supports the delivery of Western Power's component of WA's distribution energy resources roadmap, uh, which consists of the development of limit devices for security constrained economic dispatch and whole of system planning. So Nathan is a graduate from the University of Western Australia in 20, uh, 2001 with a Bachelor of Engineering and Commerce and also completed a Master of Engineering Science at Curtin University. He's also a Chartered Professional Engineer and on the National Engineers Register. He's had over 19 years of experience in the Australian and international power industry, which has included engineering leadership, design, planning, operations and field roles across utility and consulting businesses. So without further ado, the floor is now yours, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelvin, um, for the introduction. Uh, much appreciated. Um, just good morning or good afternoon to um, some of you in the Eastern States, and I hope you're keeping well in these challenging times. Okay, um, I'm gonna, I'm very pleased to be able to talk through some of the network use cases for distribution and storage um, this morning. I'm gonna be sharing a set of slides, um, but I will be turning my video off just while I'm presenting. So just bear with me for a moment. So I might just ask Kelvin if you can just let me know whether you can see, see my screen, please, which should just be the front page of the presentation. Okay, still waiting for it. No problem. Okay, it started. Okay, I can see it now. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I suppose one of the things, what I'm hoping to try and give a bit of an overview today is just a bit of an overview about firstly who Western Power are, um, for those of you that don't know, um, what our grid transformation journey has been to date, touch on some of the changes that we're grappling with um, from an operational perspective, particularly in the face of um, high DR. Um, environment, um, given the nature of the, the Western Australian or the Southwest interconnected system. A um, bit of an overview on some of the trials that are hoping to try and articulate some of the network benefits, certainly in these use cases for distribution connected storage, and then also how that is playing into the, the next steps so with respect to distribution storage. So, um, okay. So just in terms of who Western Power are, so we are the transmission and distribution network service provider in the southwest of Western Australia. So um, we're in, probably in a fortunate position of actually being the transmission and distribution network operator, which allows us to optimise across transmission and distribution. So um, as distinct from the uh, power generators and the main retailers. So just a little bit about Western Power. So we, we look we look after the region in the southwest of Western Australia. So that's the orange um, shaded area that's indicated on the right hand side of this particular slide. So we've got about uh, over 1.1 million connection points, which serves over 2 million customers. Um, so of those 1.1 million customers, over 330,000 of 1.1 million connection points, over 330,000 have some form of solar PV installed, which in a very similar way to is happening elsewhere in Australia is putting some um, challenges on not only the um, operating the network, but also the broader power system. 
um, of interest as well of those um, customers. We're seeing that there is uh, an uptake of the high in the meter battery, but it is on the slower side. So certainly relative to the amount of solar PV, we've got over 2,000 behind the meter customer systems connected at the moment. Um, again, one of the unique characteristics of the Swiss is it is an isolated network. So we've got no interconnection. So in terms of what we're able to do with excess solar, um, it's, it, is like, it, is inter it is isolated to um, what we're able to do with the current um, Swiss network. So probably one of the other unique characteristics of the network is that 52% of the medium voltage distribution overhead network um, of which there's quite an appreciable amount of, serves less than 3% of the customers. So I'll touch on that, um, how that kind of fits into the broader strategy um, throughout my presentation. And probably the other important component is that we've got 13 community batteries that are currently installed and operating on the Swiss. Okay, so this is um, a conceptual slide of um, how we're looking to evolve our network. So. Um, recognising that there is um, changing energy um, consumption from customers um, is just changing the way about changing the way that we think about um, using our assets and how we can um, how the customers can reap the benefits of a modernised electricity network. So at the moment, or well, certainly in years gone past, we've got a very well developed and single integrated network. So that's again a, a largely um, strongly mesh transmission network um, with the distribution network emanating from that supplying customers. Um, one of the unique characteristics, obviously, we're covering a large amount of territory. So some of the because the distribution overhead network um, traverses some um, substantial distances. So in terms of our actual grid transformation journey, one of the things that has caused us to um, examine different models is the fact that a lot of that infrastructure was installed in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and as a result, particularly where we've got low density of customers supply from long stretches of network, thinking about, well, given the changes to technology and that we're going to need to spend an appreciable amount, generally speaking, an appreciable amount of capital um, refreshing that infrastructure in the next 10 years, what's actually the best way to be able to serve those customers. So as part of that, we've tested a number of different models um, from the current integrated network through to the fully decentralized model. Um, what our modeling um, has suggested is that this modular network, where we actually do have a large interconnected network that, sold, that serves those customers that have got generally high energy demands, not only now, but into the future. Um, but for those customers that are, have low energy use or certainly relative to the length of network, there are other types of technologies such as microgrids and standalone power systems that are more appropriate to be able to serve their needs. So we're seeing as a future is tending towards the concept of a modular network. So in terms of some of the modeling um, that we've undertaken, um, there's probably three main ways that we look to, to be able to understand this. So because as is the case with any complex problem, um, starting with simplicity and not allowing complexity to overwhelm um, and paralyze action is the key. So as a result of this, we developed a three step methodology um, using an approach that's commonly referred to as backcasting. The methodology starts by developing a view of the future customer energy needs. So this, um, helps to really determine if we were starting from scratch, so having that greenfield view, what's the optimal way to serve customers with the lowest cost or lowest life cycle cost solution. So, uh, and that also, as a result, there is no one energy need, particularly once you're looking at over a long period of time. Um, so there's multiple energy scenarios in this particular state. Um, the second, the, the next part of that um, is trying to then understand from our current state, how do we, what's the most, what's the optimal way to transition from the current state to the future state? So as part of that, we developed a 30 year energy forecast that factors in customer choices, external market changes, and shifts in industrial, commercial, and residential development. Um, one of the benefits of, or one, one of the benefits or the way that we've articulated this is actually presenting these energy needs geographically, um, including detailed energy usage profiles. Okay, 
So what does this actually translate to? So as I've touched on, there's a number of different, we've looked at it from three different aspects. So from a macroeconomic, um, a macro demographic and a customer technology perspective. Um, so what we've looked to develop um, over the last few years is what we've coined as the grid transformation engine. Um, so what this is actually looking is trying to present the, um, under a number of different scenarios over different energy needs that materialize under these different energy scenarios and how the existing network or how the existing network is able to be able to supply those needs where there may be some shortfalls and then integrating future solutions to optimize what the needs are in the future. So what we've got here is um, one of these particular scenarios. So it's shown with a, a high, um, very broadly put mo high mining growth, low non-mining growth, um, considering an extreme climate change scenario, um, and considering a renewable thrive technology. So where customers are continuing to install solar PV at a dramatic rate, and there's a large amount of battery. So what the grid transformation engine does gives us an idea very quickly. So what this is, is the existing network shown on the right hand side that supplies the greater um, CBD and urban areas of the Perth uh, metropolitan area. Um, and it shows where we actually start to potentially have some constraints over different periods of time, so years 10, 20, and 30, uh, where there are potentially some shortfalls in capacity. So what this really then starts to or starts to help us to do, particularly oh, once we've uh, got multiple Sorry to interrupt, scenarios, Nathan. It may start to show. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I think the, the slides haven't cut through to the network constraints picture yet. Oh, okay. Okay, sure. So what can you see? Can you just see uh, the, oh. uh, the grid transformation picture then? Okay, now it's just come through. Okay, okay no problem. There we go. So uh, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. And apologies, everybody. Um, so, what, so what this is showing is really the, the constraints of the existing network superimposing those future energy needs um, of customers. So it really gives us an idea about the ability of the current network to be able to supply customers future energy needs. And we've got those views across a number of different scenarios. As you can see, here's a stylized representation of what that would look like. So we're able to test different uh, macroeconomic, macro demographic and macro and technology factors. Okay, so what this is actually leading itself to is that we're getting a, quite a clear view of um, under the different scenarios that there's three distinct parts of the network that are emerging of the future network. So the first is the um, Metro CBD, sorry, for those that are not familiar. So where that red area is shown is generally is the Perth Central Business District and the greater urban areas. Um, the yellow is generally we've got um, moderate density of customers, um, which typically supplied at the moment from overhead network. Um, and the blue is the rural area. So this is a bit of a zoom in on the Southwest where, the, where there's a large concentration of existing, um, largely residential, but there is obviously some commercial industrial customers there. So on, the, on this view, the, again, this is conceptual that we're seeing these three different segments. So in terms of what the optimal way to be able to supply the customer energy needs of the future, we're seeing that there is those um, close in the Metro area in the, um, yeah, the greater metropolitan area, um, serving those customers by underground network is the optimal um, optimal way to be able to meet their different energy needs. We've got this um, orange or mid band where their needs are best served by um, the existing overhead, what we're calling the mesh network. And then we're also seeing a distinct segment that is um, what we're coined as the autonomous network. So this is the area where um, standalone power systems or microgrids might be an optimal way to be able to serve those customers um, from the greenfield perspective. So in terms of the autonomous um, network, the alternative solutions are comparatively simple, but the transition pathway to actually getting there is quite complex, particularly as it relates to microgrids, where the converse actually applies for the meshed overhead and underground network. The actual solutions themselves are quite complex, so that does include, so when I say mesh underground and overhead, that as part of that, we would see that um, DR con control or DR active DR management, 
coupled with grid batteries and or dynamic switching um, is quite complex, but the trans transition pathway is comparatively simple. So in terms of, so I suppose that's the more strategic direction that Western Power is heading down. From a changing power system perspective, given the isolated nature, there's a few different things that are happening at both transmission and distribution level. So um, from a transmission perspective, we're seeing there's a tendency to have increased renewable generation. We've had quite an appreciable amount of wind generation connected to the north of the grid um, in the past 12 months. Um, as a result, uh, we're seeing there's a substantial amount of what, synchronous generation is becoming displaced. That's becoming even more prevalent given the rise in distributed solar, so largely rooftop solar, where we've seen over 250 megawatts of connections um, in the past 12 months. Um, so that coupled with changing energy needs of customers, so in the form of either um, increased um, energy efficiency, um, more um, inverter connected um, loads or switch mode power supplies, we're seeing the net demand on the overall power system is reducing year on year. So the effects of those four elements, or probably summarised broadly, is the changing generation mix and the reduction on what characterised as network demand is putting pressures on network voltages and seeing them increase um, and potentially compromising system stability. So we're not, uh, we've got a strategy about this, which I'll touch on in just a moment, but as um, as part of this, we've been trialling a number of different technologies over the course of the last few years and have a number of different solutions currently in train which are shown there. So of relevance, particularly to this, um, this session is around microgrids, battery energy storage, um, standalone power systems and community batteries. So from these, um, or these issues, we've developed a three-pronged, um, calling it a DER management strategy, which is around the three coloured circles, which you can hopefully see on screen, um, which are characterised as set and forget solutions, storage solutions, and real-time intervention solutions. So set and forget solutions are what I very generally call traditional network responses, so network doing network things. So for example, um, in response to some of the challenges which were to voltage control on the network. We've recently installed a large number of reactors at transmission level to be able to absorb the, um, the excess reactive power as a result of the changes in um, demand on the system. Um, the, or the third pillar is real-time intervention solutions. So by that, we're look, talking about DER management solutions. So um, there's um, obviously a lot of discussion in the industry around the roles of the distribution system operator, aggregators and distribution market operator. So being able to um, work with aggregators to not only to be able to overcome network constraints, but also provide a value stream through to the market is one of the, one of the key pillars of our DR management strategy. And last and certainly not least is the role that storage plays in all of this. So, um, that can include um, from a front of meter solution and it can also be behind the meter solution. So the remainder of this session is focused on the storage solutions. And hopefully that comes through from this diagram. They're not um, mutually exclusive. There's a large overlap between them, particularly as it relates to behind the meter storage, being able to um, coordinate and orchestrate though any behind the meter solution in response to a network need is um, critical to this moving forward. So probably just taking a step back. So looking at what storage can do from a network um, and even power system perspective. So um, broadly, it can store energy if it's not at full capacity. It can release energy if there's sufficient capacity remaining in the, the storage. Um, it can potentially provide extremely fast response. It can provide load following services, i.e. Um, market power system or broader power system market services. Um, and depending on the configuration, it can run as an operator, i.e. if it's grid fault. So very broadly put, so what we've got here just as a, to illustrate the sum of or what we're experiencing at a power system or a network power system level, is on the y-axis we've got typical load through a network element shown in the orange trace over a 24-hour period. So um, as is shown there, yeah, around the midday time frame, um, the 
we're starting to see in a number of instances, we're seeing um, load to reverse power occurring at different places in the distribution network and even at transmission level. Um, and seeing over the afternoon as that solar resource starts to reduce, um, seeing a very steep rise in the overall demand through the actual network elements to the point where we're potentially um, infringing on network ratings. So one of the benefits that storage is able to do is to be able to charge in the middle of the day and discharge that energy um, later Sorry, on. Nathan. Um, the slides again are a bit uh, frozen. So they're still stuck on the DR management strategy. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, as I've moved on to another slide. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. It ha has it changed at all? It's uh, it has not. Um, okay. What I might do, I might stop sharing and I'll. And I'll um, Reshare? Yep. Okay, uh, what storage can do? Okay, that slide is now up and your cursor is visible. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, I mean, hopefully this, I think this is the only slide I've had since that slide. Thanks, Kelvin, and apologies no for the technology issues. Um, this is the only slide that I've shown since that other one. So probably in terms of some of the, the trials that we have undertaken. So there's been, a, there's been a number of them over the last few years. So the first is what we um, coined as um, Power Bank Stage 1, which has been a joint project with Synergy, who are um, the retailer for um, non-contestable customers. So this was largely for residential and there's all, they also um, commercial and industrial customers as well. Um, so part of that was to not only provide some network provide network benefits, but also to have a community facing battery product. So there's a very uh, high level illustration of how that was done. So it was essentially a, a virtual uh, a virtual storage solution that was um, provided to certain customers in a part of the network. So able to use that and couple it with their solar and be able to draw down on that. Um, in the evening once the solar production has ceased. So from a network perspective, um, what we were looking to try and do certainly with the, the first community community battery uh, was to overcome. So from the first community community battery um, constraints associated with distribution transformers. So these community storage uh, batteries were connected to the low voltage network downstream of a distribution transformer. So when I say distribution transformer, it's that that's coupling the medium voltage to a low voltage network. Um, so they're in the order of um, hundreds of kVA. So in this particular example, um, this is really illustrating the, the issue we're trying to solve. So if you can hopefully see my cursor. So again, looking at a 24 hour time period, we're seeing the load through the network. Unfortunately, we can't see your cursor, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay. If this becomes an issue, um, uh, if you're able to send the slides to me, then worst case, I can actually run them from this side of the fence. I think we've just got a East Coast, West Coast problem. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, okay, apologies, everybody. Um, but I guess these hiccups are a bit hard to predict. Okay. Has that has that refreshed at all, Kelvin? No, it hasn't. So it was still back at the community power bank trial. Okay. Okay. Um, what I might do, if you can just bear with me for a few moments, I'll send this through to Kelvin. Everybody, apologies again. Thank you. Okay, we'll now see storage solutions. Okay, that's good. I might just, I'll give it one, one last go. So is it the 24 hour load trace that you can see? Yes, 
that's the one we can see. Okay, great. So all that this slide is looking to articulate, so if we follow the, um, the light green trace, um, as was shown on the previous slide, um, seeing some reverse power through this distribution transformer around midday. So again, where we've got um, higher solar generation uh, um, through to having e um, issues in the peak. So these initial community storage solutions were really around having a time-based um, switching action. So charging in the middle of the day from about 10 a.m. through to about 3 p.m. Um, and then discharging to the evening peak. So the net effect of that was the darker blue line that you can see there. So um, again, the reverse power through the transformer is a bit of a proxy and um, for when we're having over voltage issues from a network perspective, um, through to the reduct or to the peak issues. So certainly being able to use the, the power bank has really demonstrated improving utilization through the network elements and really helped to reduce the amount of demand on the transformer um, for the peak evening peak issues. Okay, so the second trial that we've undertaken with respect to distribution and storage is um, around a small town in the north of the state called Perendry. So I'll touch on that in just a moment. So, but the objective of this is really to provide a reliability service to um, a regional town supplied by a long overhead 33 kV network. So the actual BESS itself is a one megawatt, one megawatt hour BESS that's operating in parallel with the 33 kV network. So in terms of where Perenger is, so what, sorry, yep. Jordan. I know, uh, yep, the slides just flashed through. So we're good to go, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. So what we've got here is a um, representation of the transmission network in the Swiss. Um, as the different colours are indicating different voltages, but there's a little yellow dot that's shown at the, in the very north or to the north of the grid, um, which is the town of Perendry. So um, the town itself is about 75 kilometres from the nearest uh, 132 to 33 kV substation, and it's supplied by overhead feeder that subject just by the very nature of the terrain. It's frequently um, subject to lightning and the elements. So um, the nature of the design, the best was actually installed just on the outskirt, outskirts of town, um, such that when there was a when there is a fault on the feeder, so upstream of the town on the 33 kV feeder, the best forms an intentional island and um, supplies the town for as long as it possibly can. So that um, best was commissioned in July 2018. So in terms of the statistics, so it's actually already saved um, some pretty substantial outages on the, the network. So there's been 27 events in, I think it's about probably about 32 months. So we're just shy of three years for the trial. Um, there's been 27 events on the backbone where the best has correctly islanded and supplied the network where the customers would have otherwise been without supply. So it saved over 35 hours of outages for those customers. Um, probably one of the other important, or certainly for uh, from a technology perspective, the actual transition from the network to the best supply is within 150 milliseconds. So any change is in network supply is not discernible to the actual customers themselves. Um, so that in itself has been a, a technology challenge, but really reaping some significant rewards, um, particularly given the large number of um, other faults that the customers have been protected from by virtue of the design. So the, the as I mentioned, the town or the best islands, the town, every time there's an upstream fault, as a result of that, sometimes it does island for faults um, on feeders outside of Three Springs substation, um, which as you can see there, they're actually, we've had 384 of those events or 90% of the total events um, where the customers have actually been, um, in, I'll say insulated or haven't had been exposed to the same extent of voltage dips as they normally would or normally otherwise would have. Um, there's a number of other benefits as well. So again, your best islands when there's system under frequency events, it's very sensitive um, in terms of under frequency settings. Um, and we've had uh, one or we've had two events for faults downstream of the best. So these are town faults. 
um, where the customer outage has been unavoidable. So just talking through um, how one of these um, faults on the backbone. So for example, this is one in late 2019. Um, and what we can see here is um, uh, looking at- Sorry, Nathan, I, we don't have the next slide yet. Uh, so we've still got the table. Um, sure. Okay, I might just I might just give it a second if that's okay. Perhaps if yep. you could just let me know it's it's a slide called event thirty first of October twenty nineteen. Okay, I'm, still I'm, waiting. That's okay. I might try and I'll try and talk to it in advance of it coming. If you could just give me a um, just let me know when it does appear. So um, for this particular okay. um, fault, we actually had a fault um, just after midnight um, upstream of the of the town. Um, so has that come through? Sorry, Kelvin. Oh, uh, no, it hasn't. Uh, I wonder if you could just refresh the screen and go back and forth. Nothing yet. Okay, so I'll, 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 I will talk to it. If you can just maybe just sing out once you once it does come, because it um, be quite a quite a quick one to to talk or to get the get the feeling very quickly. Um, yep. So we had a fault just after midnight, um, and the best supply kicked in and supplied the town for um, just over five hours. Um, Again, this is probably quite a minor fault. So the crews were able to get out and to be able to restore supply quite quickly. Um, what it did actually do. So one of the things that we have done is we instigated a text messaging service to the customers in the town. So the first text message is shortly after the, the best islands, letting them know that the, the best is actually supplying and um, asking them to minimise power life to extend the life of the of the best um, until the main supply is restored. Um, the second component um, lets them know at about 20% state of charge or just before it's about to run out of capacity um, that the best is still supplying them with power um, that an outage is or could occur shortly. Um, so that's the second text message. And the third text message is indicating when they're supplied by the main line power again. So um, this particular event is really, is quite a good one outside of the fact that it happened in the early hours of the morning. So there's not really a lot that customers are able to do in terms of um, modifying their behavior over these periods of time. But we have started to see that there is a, a general trend um, emerging with respect to um, reduced energy use, but it is something that we haven't really tried to emphasize too much. But in terms of, I mean, hopefully the um, statistics shown on the previous slide are really showing that has been a very positive experience for the customers that we went to. So the, the next uh, next version of this is the Calvary microgrid, which is a, um, very has a very similar objective. So Calvary is um, the northmost part of the grid. Um, so that's um, the town of Calvary. It's a very tourist or it's a tourist destination. And it's supplied by a hundred um, kilometer um, thirty three kV overhead feeder from the nearest zone substation, which is Geraldton. So. This is, going to, uh, this is a substantially larger best, so it's five megawatts, four and a half megawatt hours, which again is operating in parallel with the 33 kV network. One of the, um, probably the different um, approaches associated with this one is integration of an existing wind farm out at Calvary into the overall microgrid. So it's really providing an enhanced level of sophistication over what is provided for Perendry. Again, um, outside of some residential solar in Perendry, Ultimately, there isn't much to be able to um, provide some additional support once the grid is operating in island mode. Um, the integration of the wind farm into the Calvary microgrid is really um, hopefully going to show that it's we're able to sustain the microgrid for much longer, depending on what the characteristics are um, on the particular or time and day when there is a network outage. Okay, so just in terms of the next um, suite of trials. So is our the next stages of the um, community battery project with 
synergy. So again, as I mentioned earlier, there are 13 TAN batteries. Um, so continuing to partner with Synergy to trial out to not only provide network benefits, but also to provide that customer facing product um, with respect to that, a virtual storage product. So uh, conscious of time, so probably the just kind of taking back to kind of where do we go from here. So um, hopefully many of you are aware that the state government has, um, or as Kelvin touched on earlier, We've got an energy transformation strategy that's currently um, well into implementation. And one of the key aspects of that is the distributed energy resources roadmap, which is, has been, again been provided by the state government. But a lot of it is um, there's a number of actions from a, both a Western Power and an AEMO perspective as how to how as to how we um, in, continue to integrate DER, so this being solar PV, batteries, electric vehicles, into the grid moving forward. So um, for those of you who haven't seen it, is, it is publicly available and there's a very snazzy roadmap that indicates a number of different actions that are associated, or some of the key actions associated with the roadmap um, that are being delivered from now up until 2025. So. A lot of it, again, is in the name of trying to build towards the distribution system operator and distribution market operator future and all of the um, series of regulations and technology that needs to be um, put in place to enable that. So in terms of the roadmap itself, it con consists of um, four key themes around technology integration, tariffs and investment signals, DR participation and customer protection and engagement. So under these themes, there are different elements, um, one of which is hopefully very obvious and I've highlighted on the screen, if you can hopefully see it, is around distribution battery storage. So one of the first key actions associated with that outside of the community storage trials that we've been undertaking with Synergy is to produce a distribution storage opportunities information paper, uh, which we did actually release publicly late last year. So one of the objectives of this was to outline the opportunities where Western Power is seeking to obtain um, storage services across the Swiss to meet emerging network needs. Um, as part of this, we outlined some of the current and emerging issues on the Swiss and outlining how storage could alleviate these issues and next, step, next steps for those um, storage opportunities. So really, this is probably the, I'll, I'll say the first step on a um, probably much larger pathway. So again, the storage information paper is really trying to articulate some of the benefits associated with storage. And again, I'll touch on that on some of the, the next slides. Um, the, the next step following from that is actually releasing discrete opportunities to market via commercial process and probably not necessarily focused around storage. This is around any particular network needs. Um, in advance of the release of the first uh, network opportunities map again, which is earmarked in the DER roadmap um, as being um, in place from October 2021 and the associated alternative option strategy. Um, after that, it would be an ongoing assessment of any opportunities, so be it distribution, storage or other, um, as per the alternative option strategy where we go through a commercial process. So. As I touched on a little bit earlier, there's a number of things that um, storage could do. Um, and again, we're again from a um, as from a reliability or from a technology and reliability perspective, or considering those factors and what availability needs are, um, certainly this uh, package of work is agnostic to whether that's actually provided by in front of the meter or behind the meter resources. So just a little bit on the why now. So um, again, uh, there's a few dot points that are shown there. So why we've done it. So again, storage can maximize the utilization of the network, uh, meaning that we're extracting optimal value from existing assets. Um, it plays an important role in ensuring power system stability and security, particularly where we are seeing like the extremes at a um, system minimum to system peak over a very short period of time is concerned. Um, Again, we've seen some significant advancements in the capability, efficiency and cost of the technology, which means it's becoming increasingly viable alternative to traditional investment options. 
Um, the next point is that it can facilitate um, further investments in renewable energy. So it's allowing us to be able to continue to host increasing amounts of um, renewable energy on the grid. Um, probably the fifth point is as well, again, having talking to the uh, power bank solution and also the reliability solution that has been um, put in place at Perendra. We're starting to demonstrate some of the network benefits associated with storage. And probably the the last component of the well is around um, the development of advanced planning tools and scenario planning. So I'll, again, I'll try and touch on that again. So this is with relation to the grid transformation engine and how, how different energy scenarios play out over, over the longer time frame. So in terms of, so this, this particular slide is more tailored around how distribution connected storage could overcome or help support um, some of the conventional network investment triggers. So um, it doesn't touch on um, transmission drivers, but like what it is hoping to try and articulate is where there are some of the benefits. So again, if you've got an appreciable amount of resource downstream of a particular constraint, it can provide support. So that could include at a transmission level, be it from a voltage or a thermal over on the medium voltage um, from a thermal overload or an under or over voltage perspective, reliability as well if the grid forming capability is present and similarly um, voltage and thermal considerations on a low voltage network. So just in terms of capacity driven examples, so this could be at transmission or distribution um, level. So this is the picture I showed earlier where we've got a constraint on a network element as shown by the dotted line. Um, so if there's a, a sufficient amount of storage downstream of the resource, it could be charged in the middle of the day and discharged for the evening peak um, to be able to overcome that particular constraint, meaning that we're not um, up, needing to upgrade the transformers and put in a larger unit, or it could be transformers, or it could be at a medium voltage feeder level or up to transmission level. Probably the other component that we think from a capacity driven perspective is important is looking at a zone substation. So we're looking at a, um, so for typically be 132 kV to 22 kV. So typically in a zone substation, we would have um, three power transformers where it's fully developed. So particularly in the face of where peak demand is reducing and one of those transformers is reaching end of life. So typically at once the transformer reaches end of life, we'd go in and um, replace the end of life transformer with an equivalent size power transformer or even larger ones such that we're retaining sufficient capacity. Uh, but one of the things that storage is able to do, if we're able to maintain the load below a certain threshold, which is shown by the dotted blue line on the slide, hopefully you can see it. Um, potentially what we could then do is- avoid Sorry, Nathan, unfortunately that, we can't see it. Um, that end oh. of life, that's okay. Yeah, so I'll let you continue. It is just presenting what I'm. Yeah. Um, again, we'll be sharing the slides after at the conclusion of the session as well. So I'm very happy to take questions afterwards. Um, so what, one of the benefits that storage is able to do in the face of a declining load forecast, if we're able to man, maintain the capacity at a zone substation below the reduced um, substation threshold, that is um, certainly um, a pretty substantial value from a network perspective even if it is just deferring that expenditure for um, a number of years. So again, this, the, again, the next slide, I'm not sure if you, whether you can see it, but what all it is really trying to do is to try and look at what, uh, what a medium voltage network feeder does look like. So one of the, the key concepts that we are looking to, to try and test is Obviously, the further down in the network you are installed, have battery storage available to you, the more things it can do for you. So for example, if you've got um, sufficient storage downstream of a distribution transformer to avoid an upgrade, um, that's a great benefit. Similarly, if you, you could potentially hit multiple drivers with a similar investment, if you've got um, commensurate issues, say at the medium voltage feeder exit cable with respect to thermal capacity. So one of the things that we are looking to try and un better understand is actually when do some of those other issues start to materialize or when could they possibly materialize such that we're not 
um, responding to capacity shortfalls um, as they emerge and having a have a much larger look as to well what is the more strategic place to do it. So looking to try and hit multiple drivers um, with a single investment. So when I say multiple drivers, that could be a distribution transformer upgrade and it could also be a feeder um, and set cable upgrade as well. So just my final slide again, apologies if it's not showing. Um, so the actual storage opportunities paper articulates a number of areas where we are likely to have some evening peak capacity shortfalls. Um, um, put out to the market. So I'm not able to answer any questions about that, unfortunately, because we're through a commercial process. But this is probably like an early indication of what our more fulsome network opportunities map would look like. So it'll be providing an early indication to market um, where we're potentially needing to uh, make some augmentations to the network in the face of network needs. So that would certainly include capacity driven um, augmentation and also reliability as well. Um, that's everything that I had to talk through. Apologies for all of the technology issues. I'm very happy to take some, some questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so the first question we've got is from uh, Chris McEwen, who, who won't be able to speak, uh, ask it live, but so I'll ask it on his behalf. And it's a quick one. Um, so what technology is used for the batteries? Is it uh, Tesla, Flow batteries? And do you see a trend uh, from one form of te storage technology to another? Mm. Great question. Yeah, stages again, Mike. So we are agnostic to the, to the actual technology type that has been used, has been used, but there have been lithium iron to date. Um, particularly from a cost and technology perspective, but we're by no means close to that as a potential solution. Again, recognising that there are other technologies that are rapidly advancing in this space. Okay, great. Now I've got another question from Jeremy Evans. Um, would you like to, I'll see if we can ask, let you ask it in person. If not, not in the interest of, oh, here we go. Um, Nathan, uh, a fascinating uh, presentation, uh, comprehensible in large part, even to this uh, relatively uneducated electricity consumer. But I wonder, do you yet envisage, are you in a position yet to envisage either behind the meter or in front of the meter investment in storage as taking the lead? and for whatever reasons. That's in the long thanks, term. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. So I think the short answer is, like, I don't think we have a position. I suppose one of the, it is an excellent question, and I think it is one that we do get regularly. Certainly, again, putting my pure network hat on, and I suppose even from a system operator perspective, one of the key aspects of that, enabling that behind the meter and also providing a value stream to the actual behind or, or behind the meter storage is actually being able to appropriately orchestrate that. So whether that, again, like that would be from an aggregator perspective. So again, when we do have a network constraint, like need having that certainty around the response. So again, what the communication standards and availability of the resource is one of the key aspects. So I haven't touched on it explicitly in this, but one of the, certainly one of the flagship projects from the Swiss perspective is Project Symphony, which is looking to try and trial um, a number of different DER technologies, including front of the meter batteries to be able to not only overcome network constraints, but also provide a market solution. So yeah, I suppose it is one of the things where we d definitely see there is a need, certainly in the Swiss, to be able to um, harness that resource in the not too distant future. So um, again, being able to provide early signals as to where we have network constraints, we do recognise is one of the keys to being able to give um, a bit of certainty or, or as much certainty as we can to um, the fact not only the battery owners, but the aggregators as to where they can actually orchestrate these resources to be able to get a um, enter into an agreement with the network provider. 
Did that answer the question? Uh, yes. Um, may I just add that I was thinking of investment by the um, the customer or investment from the investment market. Uh, and I thought that investment in uh, behind the meter could also tap an alternative investment source. Um, that, that is true, yeah. I suppose even in the current, the current landscape, so the, the, certainly from a West Australian perspective, that would be like the network provider would enter into an agreement with the, the aggregator to be able to provide that source. And then that's, that would enable that value stream there. Thank you. Yes, that answers it nicely. Um, in the interest of time, I've got one question uh, and any other questions from anyone else um, is how have you been able to work with the economic regulator to justify these investments in trials, given that, that Western Power is a, a regulated monopoly? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So probably the key to this is as well, like um, probably the one thing I haven't touched on is and maybe self-evident is actually the cost of the storage. So particularly when it relates to the network investment that we are avoiding. Um, so that again would be avoiding the upgrades of the transformers. Um, so the actual cost of the storage itself from a network perspective is, um, well, the net conventional solution is much cheaper than the storage off, off the bat. Now, that's why one of the key aspects of this is actually partnering with the retailer. So what they would then be looking to try and do is capture all any retail benefits associated with the storage. Um, and then like, which the future extension of that would be provision of services into the wholesale market. So from a network service provider's perspective, we are, it's quite clear that we are not able to provide that, which I think is a sensible position to be in. However, that would be provided by the retailer. So um, who is able to, again, capture that and provide the, for example, spinning reserve or load following services from the storage. So again, that comes back through to the, to building out the distribution um, integration of the D those resources into the wholesale market, which again is looking to be done through the, um, the development of the distribution system operator and market operator functions. Okay, great. Uh, so we've got time for one more. If not, um, I guess there was, the, based on the ACT community battery trials, they mentioned that they were running the battery the, the, the accounting of power flows from the customer to the um, distribution battery was a, a virtual accounting process and the battery itself operated independently. In the power bank trials, is that the case? Or do you actually track the power flows from the households into the power bank? Oh, sorry, Nathan. I think you've broken up. My, I'm off to stop my video. Okay, that's working. Um, so it, it's a it's a very similar model. Similar model, yes. So, but that would be again something that we do look to enhance the sophistication of moving forward. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, in that case, I'll begin to bring this webinar series to a close. So. There will be two more webinars on the Victorian Clean Energy Fund uh, webinar series. And the first will be Julius Asanto from AMO WA on the operational impacts of DER on the WA Swiss network. And that will be run on the 21st of April. And we'll have another presentation from Sarah Russell Smith from Amber Electric. And for, for those of you not familiar with, they're a retailer who's offering a wholesale, wholesale electricity pass through electricity price and via subscription models. So she'll be presenting on the development of, they've got a customer load shifting program, which they partner off with bat, behind the meter batteries. And that will be running either on the 12th or the 13th of May. So we're still yet to lock in that date specifically. So uh, for more details of these and other upcoming events, please visit the Climate Energy College and the Energy Transition websites. And I would like to thank all of you for attending. And thank you very much, Nathan, for your presentation. So this draws the webinar to the close and thank you so much.